can we go back way to the beginning of your career in the military? Were you drafted or did you enlist? In I certainly, I certainly wasn't drafted. No, ma'am. I was a, went in as a part of an activated National Guard unit. Had you enlisted in the National Guard? Oh yes. Where were you living at the time? My home was in Delta, Pennsylvania, but I joined the Maryland National Guard. Delta, Pennsylvania is a border town. It's right on the Mason-Dixon line. And the nearest guard unit was in Maryland, so I joined that unit. It was the 29th Division. Do you remember what year that was? I believe it was in 1937. Why did you join? That's a very good question. I was young at the time, a little adventure involved, I suppose. It certainly wasn't the pay. As I recall in those days we got two or three dollars a week for showing up for drill. But it, and my friends did it, so it's one of those things a young man does. Do you recall your first days in service? First days? Yes, I do. Uh, we were, I think the first two weeks that we were called up, we spent in the local armory at Bel Air, Maryland. When was it that you were, your guard was actually called up? I believe it was January 1st, 1940. We were part of a, at that time we were supposed to serve one year and then be released. But of course, uh, Pearl Harbor, put a cinch on that. So we were not released. Of course, we stayed for another four, I stayed for another five years. When you were called up initially in 1940, um, what was that like when your first days in service were that call up? What was it like? Yeah. Do you remember where you went and your basic training? Well, our basic training was at Fort Meade, Maryland. We were <coughs> terribly short of uh, equipment. Uh, I cite, like to cite one example. I was assigned as a sergeant in charge of the mortar platoon. I was handed a field manual on the 81 millimeter mortar and told that I was in charge of the mortar platoon. <laughs> we didn't have an 81 millimeter mortar. We had broom handles and things of that nature to use for aiming stakes. So the first three or four months, that was the kind of equipment we had. Our helmets were World War I helmets. Uh, we were awful short just about everything. Uh, we got a lot of uh, close order drill and things that normally go along with basic training. Although in the National Guard we also had that, so it was not, it was, it was interesting but not too exciting. Now, before you were telling me that you had actually had some previous experience, you were at Penn State? I had, I had with Penn State for one semester in 1936. I was 16 years old. It was the end of the Depression, and I came from a poor farm family. There just wasn't money for me to continue schooling. So I had one semester, and during that semester, I took a reserve officer training program that they had at the school. So when you were called up, why were you a sergeant right off? Because of your in the National training? Guard, in the National Guard, I had been promoted to corporal. But when we went into federal service, nearly every enlisted non com as we called them, was promoted one rank. So I was corporal. When I, overnight, I became sergeant. That was just that simple. <coughs> From that point, of course, I was promoted to, and this came along real fast. I don't know how many months later, I was promoted to first sergeant. And of course, the first sergeant in our company and in the infantry, I think we were supposed to have around 200 men, but we never had more than 150 because, again, it was the beginning of things and the draft was just getting underway. But then, as I, as I told you earlier, uh, I went off, I was taken out of the unit to go to Officer Canada School. And during the time I was in Officer Canada School, 90 Day Wonder School, we called it. <laughs> 
I was promoted to, again, to Master Sergeant. But I only drew one month's pay as a Master Sergeant because six or eight weeks later I was commissioned a second lieutenant. So I did go through all the ranks from private through to and including Master Sergeant. Pretty quickly, too. Well, I, I did what I was told, when I was told, and I insisted that those serve under me do the same thing, and it worked. I didn't have the brain associated with the college education, but when I was given a job to do, I did it. Where did you go to officer candidate school? Aberdeen, Maryland. How long were you at Fort Meade before you went to OCS? Well, it was about a year and a half, I think. I'm not sure. I have a a bundle of, we call it our 201 file, a bundle of papers by yay thick. I, I could trace this as need be, but I'm not sure of this, but I have, I have those papers. So your duties at Fort Meade then were practicing and getting ready for the... Well, we had drills, of course, as I told you. We <laughs> broom handles and rocks and everything else to, to duplicate possibility with this equipment. We eventually got the equipment we were supposed to have and of course during the course of time that we had it we actually had some practice on the firing range using real, real missiles. And the unit of course was a D company which is the fourth company of the battalion that were called the heavy weapons company. We had uh, machine guns and mortars one platoon of the mortars and the rest were machine guns. So we all had training in the use of the weapon, training of the, on the field actual range practice. Do you remember any of your instructors during basic training? Well, I remember some of the officers uh, of our company, of course. Uh, I remember one in particular, a lieutenant Lieutenant Grat Hankins, he was, uh, he came with us from the National Guard too, and I believe he was at a, a rank of a sergeant in the National Guard, and he was commissioned to second lieutenant when we were called up. He turned out to be an excellent instructor, and uh, I think later on in the conflict, he became part of uh, General Eisenhower's staff on the invasion of Europe. I'm not too sure about that, but uh, our company commander's name was Archer. He was formerly a lawyer from Aberdeen, Maryland. Uh, but we had many instructors, of course, and I, I don't I, that's, that's a long time ago. When you went to OCS in Aberdeen, what did they teach you there? Well, it was the ordinance, uh, ordinance uh, training. Uh, we had bombs and ammunition. We had uh, motor mechanics. We had public speaking. Of course, we had the usual physical training. Uh, I recall it. The, the uh, close water drill associated with the military for me was a laugh because I. I taught it in myself in the, in the infantry, and uh, when we were at OCS, the instructors would pick on an individual, call them out to lead the platoon and drill. Well, I knew that close order drill book by heart, and I had one session of it, and they never called me again because <laughs> I could have well taken over in that, that department as the instructor, I'm sure. But these are the things that come along, and we took it as a came, you know. But we had uh, very extensive training in um, bombs, the makeup of bombs, the uh, numbers on the law members, a lot of the fuses were M10, and M20, M30, and so forth. And we used to go M happy trying to remember all those numbers, but we had to handle them later and we shouldn't, we had to know their qualities and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And where did you go after OCS? I was transferred to, I don't remember the unit number again, but I was transferred to a unit at Tucson, Arizona. And there, uh, 
I think there was only about five or six people assigned to what was supposed to be a 70-man company. And other th these ordnance units that I associated with, each, one, each heavy bombardment group had one of these so-called ordnance maintenance and supply companies. In other words, their duties were to provide the things that I mentioned, the, the bombs, repair the guns, repair the trucks. In fact, we even had a watch repairman. In our little shop, it was on wheels. We had a little machine shop, a welding shop, but we could do take care of all those needs, and we did. Well, when I went to Tucson, Arizona, again because of the early part of the war and the shortage of personnel and equipment, there were the unit had been designated, but there were only three or four men and myself were there for about I think maybe two or three months. Uh, I don't want to trick myself in here to filling in the time because it, uh, my military service covers a lot of space for the short time I was there. And during the time I was in Tucson, I was promoted to first lieutenant. And I got the idea that I might like to fly these things. So I applied for flight training and was accepted. In those days, to be into the flight training program, you had to have two years of college. Well, of course, I didn't have that, but they waived it because the need was still great, and uh, so I went off to pre-flight school in Santa Anta, California. I don't know how long that lasted, but a relatively short time. And then uh, from there, I was back, sent back to a little airfield near Tucson, like way out in the desert, where we took uh, called primary training, little bits of airplanes. I think I remember the name of the thing. It was Orion open cockpit. I think it was a five-cylinder. I remember the engines because those engines always intrigued me. It was a Kerner five-cylinder engine. And these, uh, that was the very beginning of the fight training. And our instructors there were civilians. It was a two-place plane. I don't think I lasted more than about two or three weeks there because I just positively could not uh, get along with my civilian instructor. Uh, he insisted each morning that we line up and salute him, and uh, I just I just wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't salute a civilian. I, I was gung ho, gung ho military. I wouldn't do it, and this t one word, one thing led to another, and I wound up being dropped from the fight training program. It didn't hurt my military career because I continued to be a first lieutenant. And shortly after that, I was assigned to some kind of a research project that was uh, initially in the B-24 airplane, I think it was, the waste gunners. They had, uh, they could slide a door open in the side of the plane. And it, if, if they weren't careful, they'd hit their own wingtips with a machine gun. And I was assigned to a research project to try to do something that would prevent them from hitting that wing. So to make it, uh, I guess, militarily legal to fly, they sent me off to aerial gunnery school. And I was there for, I think, three or four weeks, and I was, was given- Was that still in Tucson, Arizona? That was in Las Vegas, Nevada. And they, that gave me uh, what they call an air, air crew member, I think it is. I'm qualified to wear the wings of an air crew member. And here again, you, you, we've, it, was, it was a child's play for me because uh, in the infantry I knew, but used to know every name, every part in that machine gun. And some of the aircraft machine guns are basically the same. And as far as uh, shooting is concerned, I grew up on a farm I, when I had my first rifle when I was nine years old, and uh, I rarely missed what I aimed at. <laughs> In any event, then from that point on, I was sent, I believe, to Venice, Florida. And again, I was given command of a, a company which comprised two or three enlisted men and a tent full of equipment. These things were all forming at the time. There was no... Uh, you know, the war had not broken out officially? The war had broken out, but we just didn't have the people and equipment to provide all this over overnight. But the, the administration part of it had already set up. The companies were designated. From there, I transferred, went on from there to Italy. And I spent, uh, I don't know, 20, 
23 months, I think it was 23 months, in Italy. And Do you remember the uh, time frame on that? Uh, I, well, I couldn't to kind of figure it backwards. I was officially, I was home December, latter part of December 1945, and I was about 21 months over there. And there, of course, I served in the capacity of the company commander of this unit that served the, uh, the heavy bomb group. I don't forgotten the designation on the bomb group, but then again, this 201 file that I have would, would get, get that. And when I went there, the company commander's name was Cohen, but he was transferred out, Ralph Cohen. He was transferred out, of course, and then I was put in his position, so I was the company commander. You were the company commander over in Italy? In Italy, yes. Do you know where that was located in Italy? We were located near Foggia. Foggia was, I believe, it's sort of more or less, not in really in the south. I'd say it's a little south of the the mid half of the of uh, Italy, and there were several airfields around Foggia. There was did one. Did we have a, a United States base there, or did we just use their? Well, of course, the Germans had been pushed out a short time before, but Fo Foggia had a main airport, and then there were several satellite airports around. So we argue our people moved in, and of course, took over. Foger, F O G E R? F O G G I A. And how long were you in Italy? About 23 months. That's no. a long time. Well, what was your job assignment there? My job? I told you, the company commander of the Ordnance Supply and Maintenance Company. As a company commander, what kind of things would you be responsible for? Well, <laughs> Sort of like a father and son arrangement. I was the the command of the company. Uh, I had to maintain discipline. I had to uh, oversee the operation of the normal administrative details of a company. Uh, we, we of course, had our own kitchen. We had we had to provide our own sanitary facilities. Uh, look out for the men. And when I use the word men, I, I, I'd like to change that a little bit. To, I think over the, over the years, none of us were men. We were all boys, and I quote Brokoff on that. We just thought we were men. And uh, during the time we were there, I lost one man. Uh, his death was not uh, combat related. And uh, Aside from that, I didn't. We had no particular uh, health problems or any 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 particular real problems. I had few disciplinary problems. Uh, I was, of course, involved in censoring letters and things of that nature. I remember a couple of times I had to administer company punishment because of someone trying to send word home that they were in such a spot. Typical kid stuff. I mean, they were, I didn't consider them to be any enemy aliens or anything, any such thing, but we had regulations and you were not allowed to tell, write home and say, I'm in such and such a spot. I remember this one case, I called the man, young man in and <laughs> pointed out to him that that couldn't go and he would have to be punished for it. Well, his punishment was changing truck tires for a week. Uh, it didn't hurt him, but it, it let him know and the others around him that we did mean business when we said something. And of course, this, uh, you know, to be a, a commanding officer, you have to be, uh, you have to lose a lot of common sense, you have to be one of the boys, and yet you have to let the boys know that you are the boss. It's just that simple. What rank were you at this time? When Captain. Oh. Were you a tough commanding officer? Certainly I didn't consider myself to be tough. I never asked my men to do anything that I hadn't done or wouldn't do myself. That was my theory and it works. And uh, 
I, I, as I told you, I had no disciplinary problems. Uh, we got our job done. That's the important part of the whole issue. We had an assignment and that was done and we did it to the best of our knowledge. And uh, proof of the pudding in that respect was that we rarely got a visit from higher, off, higher headquarters. And of course, if, if things weren't happening according to plan, higher headquarters would soon be on my neck but they rarely came out to see us because our job was being done. We were part of a machine. Uh, when the rare force needed 100, 500 pounders or whatever, they'd get in touch with us and our boys would load them on the trucks and run them over to the airfield. We had a bomb dump, you know, I don't know how many. Is that what your main job for your Well, like I told you, the main, main, the main job was to take, repair the machine guns, provide them with ammunition, and provide them with their bombs, They'd call us and say they were one of a certain size bomb and so many. Well, we had the trucks and the people to do it. And so we'd, then you would take the, those bombs? We'd go to our bomb dump, which is over yet another field, a hundred quarter of a mile away, perhaps. We had piled the bombs all over the place. And they went different size bomb and they'd call for the fuses. Some, some fuses were the type that explode when they contact. Others were fuses that uh, would go off uh, 10 seconds later, or for example, designed to blow up a building. You would hit the building first, let the bomb go down through, and then blow, and then blow up. And the instantaneous model would blow up when it touched the building, things like that. Sounds like a pretty dangerous place to work. Did you have any incidents of ordnance blowing up? No, and of course, uh, there was very little, very little possibility of that if we followed the rules that we were taught. The bombs themselves, I, I got the fractured leg, two bombs rolled together, like 500 pounders, and my, I, I fractured my leg. No danger of the bomb going off without the fuse. It takes a fuse to set the bomb off. It, uh, this case where I hurt my leg, it's the tailgate of the truck was open and the bombs began rolling out and I ran over to try to stop it. And I got my leg between two bombs. But, not much danger of the thing blowing up, <laughs> but as you point out, it sounds dangerous to you, but if you get to work with these kind of things, you get to understand them, that's, that's an important issue. While you were in Italy, do you have any memorable experiences? <laughs> well, we all had memorable experiences. <laughs> Can you think of one or two that you could tell me about? <laughs> I always like to commend the uh, ingenuity of the people I worked with. In our little company, we had tools, all kinds of tools, and it would never cease to amaze me, even at the young age that I was, it seemed to amaze me how people could dream up ways of providing personal comfort. <laughs> we lived in tents in the city of, of uh, Foggia had been heavily bombed during the war. Some of our, they'd take, our guys would go there and scavenge a sink, for example, out of a bathroom, rig up a wooden platform to hold it, and then they'd get a hold of a tank, I don't know what kind of tanks they used, but they'd have a small tank they got out of some junkyard or something and put for water. They had a homemade water truck that they built themselves using an English Ford truck and they got a half of a Italian tank car out of a railroad yard, cut it in half with the torches, and rigged this thing up to cart water. And they'd come around every day, they had to go get a tank of water and fill these little things up with a tent so you could have a sink to wash. They had stoves that they made from five gallon paint cans, a brick, and some copper tubing. It's so simple that it, uh, it's almost sounds funny, but they use f for five gallons of gasoline, you could keep, oh, keep warm all night. And this gasoline stove, it was a brick with glass, gasoline dripping on a brick. When it gets hot, the gasoline doesn't explode, it ignites into a roar. And for a, a smokestack in a tent, they took expended artillery shells, cut the ends out of them, weld them together to make a stovepipe. I mean, these, are the kind of, these guys were ingenious. And uh, that helped a lot because uh, to keep the trucks rolling sometimes it took a little ingenuity. I know we had, uh, 
it was a no-no to have what we call a deadline. And the trucks that aren't being used, they're sitting out back because we need parts that haven't come in or we can't get them. There was one part in the, one of the trucks we call a weapons carrier in the front steering mechanism that had two tapered roller bearings. And they would wear out and you just couldn't steer the truck. And my machinist, he says, Captain, if I could get some brass, he says, I could make bushings that'll do the same job. Well, they scavenged some brass rods from the Italian shipyard. And he made these bushings. Well, the truck wouldn't steer as well. It was hard to steer, but it would go. That kept the truck on the road. That helped us do our job. It kept that deadline down to low. These are the kind of things they could do, but using their ingenuity. And I, I always thought that was the greatest uh, asset we had. Wow. We had to dig uh, a pit by our kitchen to take the kitchen swill. So similar to our modern day septic systems. And the soil where we were was terrible to dig. Well, one of them come up with the idea, and it worked. They buried a 100-pound bomb and then set it off. It loosened the dirt up and blows up a hole. There's the start. I mean, <laughs> you give them, the, give them the tool, they'll find a way out. <laughs> Very resourceful. <laughs> uh, let me back up for a minute. Where were you when Pearl Harbor was hit? Do you remember where you were? I definitely do. I was at Fort Meade, Maryland, hoping to go home in two weeks. <laughs> that was at the end of our initial one-year call-up period. And do you remember your feelings at the time when you and how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, first of all, I don't think I even knew Pearl Harbor existed. I don't, it, just, uh, it was a name, that's all. Uh, how I felt at the time, you're talking 60-plus years, I don't know, dear. How did Pearl Harbor change your plans? Obviously, you didn't leave the service then. You were going to go home in two weeks? Well, I was, I was scheduled to be released in two weeks, but as uh, I mentioned earlier, I was a gung-ho uh, soldier. I, right now, I'm ready to go to... Did you just stay right on? Did you get any leave? Oh, I know. I didn't get any leave. I didn't get any official leave in four and a half years. When I was released from the service, I think I got 90, 120 days. I was work. I came home from the service the very end of December, and I came to Hartford on, a, I believe, a Thursday. I got a job on Friday, bought working clothes on the weekend, and went to work Monday morning. And I got paid for four months military pay while I was working because this is the accrued leave that we were entitled to. I had several what they call uh, delay in routes, that, all that moving around. I would get orders and I have them in that 201 file. I would be sent to a certain location but I'd be given two weeks to get there. It might take two days. So the rest of it you could do as my wish. A couple of times I managed to get swing home and stay a couple of days until we reached my point of designation, uh, military designation. When you were in Italy, did you get to see any parts of Italy? Oh yes, uh, I was in Rome uh, sightseeing on a so-called rest leave. This is after the war was officially over, because again, to be released to send home. They had a point system that was based on uh, one of the big way of accumulating points. The more points you had, the sooner you were sent home. Well, the Air Force boys that uh, flew the planes, every time they were involved in a, a, a combat setup, uh, they'd get a battle star, a battle star for certain battles. And certain. Each one of those counted, I think, five points. Well, of course, I never left that location, and I, I, I only had one battle star. I was given credit for the Battle of Rome, the Rome Arno campaign. But they would build up these big points, so uh, gradually we were sent home on that basis. So I was over there. I think the Japs. Uh, surrendered on around the 19th of August and I didn't get home until December. 
And I was uh, uh, reached a point in my company. I had sent my men home to over to myself and one sergeant left in the company. I mean, this is how, how they were breaking things down. But, uh, but the boys that flew the airplanes, the ones that did the actual flying, got these battle stars. And so did the ground crew because their unit got the thing. Well, I always thought that was an unfair arrangement because the guy that was up in the airplane being shot at, he deserved the battle star. But the guy that was down on the ground uh, cutting the grass didn't really, shouldn't have it, you know. But you can't have everything. Where were you when you heard about the end of the war? Drinking warm French beer in Cannes, France. I How would, did you get to France? A rest leave. We flew, we, they, sent, they flew us up there on a rest leave uh, in a C-47, we called them. They were the, the airplane that the paratroopers used. They had wooden seats, flat boards, and they landed the thing on the beach of Cannes, France, the hard, hard packed sand. And we were, where I, was, where I was when I heard of all this, I was in this French hotel that the army had taken over, really living it up on powdered eggs and spam. <laughs> then you really celebrated. <laughs> yeah. And then you had several months back in Italy. What did you do in those months before you got Well, agitated? again, when the company dwindled down to the point where there were no people left, I was. You were the sergeant. <laughs> I was assigned to uh, the ordnance work. Uh, maintenance work is based. What's based on a uh, echelon, like the word I think they used. And it, for example, the truck driver that drives the truck. First, his his maintenance is first echelon. He checks the pressure in the tires. He checks the oil and. A very limited amount of repair work. The next stage was a little bit more complicated. We were what they called third echelon. We, our job was to do unit replacement. We were supposed, for example, if a truck needed a carburetor, we were to take one out of the stock, stock box, put a new one on it, and send the other one in for repair. This didn't always work in our case because here again we were the system, but we, we did a lot of it ourselves, like that carburetor need repair, we repair it right in our own shop. But, but theoretically, we were changed apart. And that, when the war was over, I was assigned to what they called, I believe, the fifth echelon shop. I can't think of where it was now. It was somewhere just north of Naples, but there we did complete overhaul from the ground up. And I was assigned to that shop, and what they were doing primarily was preparing vehicles to be sent uh, to Japan. They were being reworked, rebuilt, painted, sealed for over the water seat, uh, transportation. And uh, I was there until the Japanese surrendered. And then I think for about two or three weeks they assigned me as an air engineering officer. I have only, well just a, on paper. I uh, spent a lot of time reading technical manuals on P-38s, but I didn't do anything on a P-38. <laughs> uh, you have told me before that you did not see any direct combat, but that you heard, what was it you heard from a distance? Well, I put it this way. I. I never saw any direct com uh, combat. But I did see a lot of the horrors of war. Uh, for example, when I was in Rome, just after the Krauts moved out, they had uh, there were I think there were ten Italian, ten Germans were killed in a uh, somebody threw a bomb in Rome, and they rounded up three hundred men and boys and took them out to a sand pit and machine gunned them. I was there, I saw that. I saw their bodies, of course. I was there when they dug them out. They took a bulldozer, covered them up in a hurry. I think that case 
just recently, within the last four or five years, perhaps that person responsible was still up for trial on that on that count. But in any event, uh, and I see in uh, when we landed in Naples to get on shore, we had to walk over the upturned hull of a ship, and then walk on a homemade catwalk to get on shore. I spent my first night in a church with no roof, uh, sleeping on a stone floor. I remember that quite well. I remember the kids in Naples. There were a lot of little kids that were, I guess they, most of them were homeless as a result of the war. But just one boy, we had about an inch of snow on the ground. He had a crutch made out of an old broom. His leg was off at the knee. Standing in our chow line with a gallon can with a wire handle, uh, begging for the food we had left over. I never forgot that. I took my allotment of food and what gave him the whole thing and walked away without breakfast myself. But the, the Naples was running wild with gangs of kids. Most of them were homeless as a result of the war. And things of this nature. Uh, and of course, uh, I've been to uh, Casino. Casino was a little village at a road intersection south of Rome. Uh, more, more than a village, I don't know what the population was, but it was quite a town. And of course, their buildings were all masonry. But one of the biggest battles of Italy was fought at Casino. We were, our, that's the battle that I got the battle star for, and that's the place that I got to see right after the fighting. When they broke through, our boys broke through there, the next stop was Rome. But uh, up on the mountain above Casino was a monastery that dates back, way back in history, I don't know, the year 1100 or something like that. The top of the mountain was a monastery. The Germans utilized that area for uh, gun emplacements and for uh, observation purposes, and they made it almost impossible to to take the thing. It, it eventually was taken by frontal attacks, but it was the repeated attacks that a lot of boys died there. And uh, the town itself just didn't exist. It looked like a pile of rubble that you might see at the city dump after all this shelling. Earlier you told me you didn't get any medals or citations, but you asked to get that battle star. Is that considered a Well, if you, were, if, if you were in an area designated as an air, a battle area, you were entitled to the battle star, whether you were pushing the bayonet or whether you were cooking the pancakes. In my case, I was cooking the pancakes. And that was for the Battle of Casino? That was the, the, the Battle Star was what they called the Rome Arno campaign, and that included the, 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 the town I referred to, Casino. Arno, A-R-N-O? I believe so. It's the name of a river in uh, Italy. See, our troops landed at Anzio. That's up the coast from Naples, and fought their way into the center of the country at this road intersection with the main route into Rome. And of course, Rome was the, the uh, I believe General Mark Clark was in charge of the affair. That was the uh, idea, was to get to Rome. Fortunately, Rome was declared an open city and uh, uh, didn't get subject to all the horrors of war. But there's one thing about the uh, little amusing incident when we, uh, after the Germans had been driven north into the Apennines, we got an opportunity to send, I don't know, a few people each week to a rest leave in Rome. And one of the boys in our company was not too bright, but a good kid, but not too bright. And when they took him into Rome, he went by the Colosseum and he says, boy, they sure bombed the hell out of this place. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get any of your leave time in Rome? Huh? Did you get a turn at getting some leave time in Rome too? Oh, I got to see a tour in Rome. I got to the Appian Way. I got to see the 
the aqueducts, I got to see the catacombs, I even had an opportunity to talk with Pope Pius XII. Really? Quite an accidental thing, we had a, an, he had an audience, velvet ropes, just keeping everybody back and there were probably 2,000 GIs around there. And he came along and uh, outside the place, the uh, vendors were selling all kinds of religious articles. So you hold them out for him to bless. And he, he uh, said to me, he said, uh, I've forgotten what it was now, but he said he had a good friend in Boston. He spoke to me for a few minutes in broken English. So I didn't, uh, didn't excite me a great deal, but it's always something to brag about, I guess. Uh, a little bit about living conditions. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were in Italy? How did they in touch? By letters only. And were you married at that time? Yes. How long had you been married? Oh, I was married in 1942. So just before you uh, just left for just before Just before I went to Officer Kansas School, I was a sergeant at the time. First sergeant at the time. So it was only letters, but you still couldn't tell where you were? Oh no, you weren't like that was no no. Hey, what was the food like? You told us a little bit. How <laughs> eggs and <laughs> that, that, that was a basic idea. <laughs> I know when we returned they had us and we came back to Virginia someplace, I forgot the Hampton Roads, I think. But anyhow they had a big mess hall. We had these German prisoners of war waiting on tables. And every table had a, in front of the plate with a quart of milk, real milk. I remember pulling the top out of that thing and drinking the whole thing before I set it down and the crowd had another one there in five minutes. And steak, we never heard of, heard of such a thing. No. What was the best meal you had in Italy? <laughs> uh, kind of hard to say, I don't know. <laughs> we. Uh, I don't know. We we ate well, of course, because none of us starved to death. But <laughs> but not steak and real milk. No, dear. Powdered milk. You get used to that after a while, but it's hard to get used to. Did you feel pressure or stress as, as the company commander? Feel what? Pressure or stress, or you just considered it as part of? Well, I don't job? know. I was too young to feel stress. There was always something to do and. I told you, I had a good bunch of people. Uh, we had a job to do and we were doing it, that's all. We were all proud that we were doing it. There's, there's something there, there's kind of a spirit you don't see too much of today. Did you do anything special for good luck? Good luck? You know, like rabbit foot or? No, we, uh, I don't know what you mean by good luck. <laughs> I used to play quite a lot of blackjack, but I never had any luck. <laughs> <laughs> what did people do for entertainment? Uh, card games. We had, uh, I think we had a radio, yeah, the Army East is a radio. See, we've had power problems over there because uh, uh, voltage changed constantly. But we had a radio that had a series of places you could plug it in, like a hundred, you could plug it in for 90 volts or 100 volts or whatever. If it wasn't coming in properly, you try a different setting. We had that thing and that was uh, one source. We had, uh, weather permitting, we had uh, athletic equipment for baseball, horseshoes. Uh, I remember, again, after the war was over, I used to let part of the guys go to the beach with a chuck they take the truck and the, and the portable kitchen unit, some ammunition, some rifles, have target practice in the surf, things like that. We had ammunition to throw at the cat after the war was over. <laughs> Guys used to take the 500 rounds down to the beach with the rifles, throw milk cans in the water and shoot at them, you know, just, just for something to do. Did you stay in touch with any of the fellow soldiers or officers after the war? I did with this one sergeant with, that I, my friend in, back in the infantry, 
and he's the one that kept me posted on what happened at Omaha Beach. Do you remember his name? I, his name was Robert Wilson, Robert C. Wilson. And I kept in touch with him for quite a few years and uh, lost count of him, I don't know. I tried recently, tried to locate him. One of my friends is pretty good on the computer, but did no luck, of course. It, I thought he's passed on by now, I guess. But uh, he was he was my uh, assistant when I was uh, platoon sergeant with the mortars. And a very good soldier, He very spit and polish. And, he survived uh, the Omaha incident with a minor, a minor uh, wound, but he was also, I believe, took part in the Battle of St. Lowell. But after that point, I lost contact with him. After the war, when you finally got rotated back to the United States, where did you go? We, were, we came in at Hampton Road, Virginia, and were sent back, I believe, to Fort Meade again to be released. We released some service at Fort Meade. Do you remember the date? Sometime the end of December, 1945. That was at, at that time I was given the option and took it of joining the reserve. And then uh, the reserve was very inactive after World War II, and I didn't do nothing but forgot about it. In the meantime, we began to have a family. And when I was called back in 1950, I had already started a new business. We had three children, a fourth on the way, and uh, boom, I get a letter. You need me. So you actually only had a lag time of about five years that you were a civilian? Yeah. Before the Army called you back? And when you were back in, in Italy in World War II, did you keep a personal diary? No. I should have, but I didn't. Right. When you came home and were discharged from Hampton Road, where did you live? Here. You became a civilian. We came here to, uh, I came back here to Hartford, Connecticut. And that's where you had your three children and, well, uh, and your business? Well, uh, coming... At, after World War II, of course, we had no children when I came back here. And we built our first home about, oh, about a mile from here. And uh, that was, I built it myself, of course, because that was my business. I built this one. Your business was construction, house building? So I, that was what, I, that was my life's work before. So uh, I built this, that home and uh, I was self-employed as a builder for 30, 32 years. Wow. And can you tell me how then you were recalled up in 1950, was it? I'm called up in the fall of 1950 and released sometime in the spring of 51. I, there was an eight-month spread. I'm not sure of the dates on that. Okay. But <coughs> I uh, was called up and all I did for eight months was warm a swivel chair. I was put in charge of a installation at Fort Dix, New Jersey that had over a hundred civilian employees and their job was maintenance of military vehicles. I had two very capable civilian uh, supervisors and uh, like I say, about all I did was sign uh, requisition forms and warm that swivel chair. And after eight months, I went to my commanding officer and I said, look, if you're going to use me in this war, let's get it over with. I want to go. Or either that or send me home. He sent me home. Just like that. Dependency. Because I had three children and one on the way. And it was tough. My wife was at home with those three little kids. And Were you able to get home at all during that eight months? Yes, two or three times while I was down there. When you were in World War II, do you recall your last day in service? Last day in the service? Not really, no. And you had said earlier, when you got out of the service in World War II, you came back to Hartford, Connecticut. 
on a Thursday, got a job on a Friday, and started work on a Monday. That's right. And was that in construction? Yes. Did no. you go on to further education? Have that again, please. Did you go on to higher ed? No. So Penn State was that that, that your one experience? semester. That was it. Did you join any veterans organizations? I joined the VFW in 1948, I think it was. And that the VFW that you're a member of now? Here yes, in yes. Avon, Connecticut? Yeah, yeah. And you've been a member since 1948? Yes. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or military in the general? In general? I'm sure it did because you had a lot of military experience. I'm trying to think how to answer that intelligently. I, I, I just certainly hope and wish there are other ways to settle the differences the world has than by war. But I, uh, I don't know what, how to answer you. Uh, we hear a lot of peace movements and a lot of them are good. But peace at any price in my mind is no good. I don't know, that's not a very intelligent answer, but it's the best I can come up with. In the VFW, what kind of activities have you been involved with? We recently built a uh, memorial. Uh, I was, my job, they officially called me the clerk of the works. My job was to supervise the construction of the foundation and the actual erection of the monument. Uh, we have a very nice uh, monument downtown. We, this I was in Avon, Connecticut? Yes, down the center. Uh, we set out as a goal $50,000 to build this thing. We had a lot of a lot, an awful lot of community help. Uh, one, the landscape architect did the drawings for it. Uh, the town uh, maintenance department allowed us to use their, their equipment to do grading and digging and so forth. The cement people donated the cement base for the foundation. Uh, the crane people donated a crane to erect it in place and all this. My job was to coordinate these people and to get it put together and so forth. It turned out very well and I'm quite proud of that. We, we, our goal of $50,000, uh, we exceeded that by about $7,000. So we set up a fund basically just to maintain the thing so that years to come when it needs cleaning or resetting or anything, we have funds to do it. And very nice monument, very, very unique. Not what year was that completed, you know? Six, ninety-six. Do you attend any reunions? No. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Would your life have been different? I don't know how to give an intelligent answer to that. I always was very patriotic, and I still am. Uh, I feel sorry for the people that are over there now, but I imagine they got pretty much the same feeling we had. We were doing something we were, I think patriotic is the word to put. I don't know. Did any of your children go into the military? No. Two. Two of the daughters married military people who are now retired. One retired as a major, one retired as a colonel. For children, how many girls and how many boys? Do you Three have? girls and a boy. And how long did you work in your business after you were retired from the service? I'm trying to think. I was about 32 years I was self-employed. I never had more than three or four employees, and I worked with them every day. 
uh, one unique part of my work was that I worked all those years and never signed a contract. Never signed a contract? Shake hands and go to work. I built some nice homes. I had nice people to work for. And you never got burned? Hmm? You never got burned by any of them? I've got burned, yes, but not, not seriously. But after I gave that up, I took up inspecting homes for people who were buying homes. That was before we had licensed inspectors. And I did that for, well, I inspected somewhere near 4,000 homes, I guess, for people who are buying homes. Holy cow. And I, I, even now, I have a, my basement is a mess. It's a workshop. I do a lot of work for uh, handicapped uh, children, church, uh, friends, I build furniture, uh, I take care of my wife, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you're officially retired? I don't like to say that. <laughs> I, I like to keep busy. Have you gone back to Italy or any of the places where you Yes, I, Yes, we've been back to Italy. Uh, In modern times? Yes, I don't know how long ago, but uh, the two girls, their husbands, I told you, were both military. We went to visit in Germany, and they drove us in the car down to Italy. We were at uh, Venice, Bologna. I don't know. But anyhow, I've been back to Italy. Not to the part that I was in, though. We were back in northern Italy. I was in s central and southern Italy. So you haven't seen that? place that you served at. I was impressed when we landed in Italy. I told you about that boat bit, but also sent in two big signboards up in the Naples Harbor. One said Singer Sewing Machine and the other said Bayer Aspen. <laughs> <In English>. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we have not covered? I think you've done a thorough job. I have nothing else to add. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Charles, for your time and your service.